about you. Are we gonna go to rehearsal? Yeah, let's go. So that video, which is a few years old now, uh, that video was made by that band Bonavox that you saw. Uh, that was not something put together by our marketing department. That was put together by the band. They had, they had used Line 6 equipment um, and they got that Sonicport VX and they were really impressed with the audio quality that it got, uh, not just for direct, but also with the microphones that were built in. And they made that video unprompted and, and sent it to us. And we liked it so much, we asked if we could use it and we put our line six header on there. Um, but for me, that exemplifies what Yamaha Guitar Group, which you're probably asking, wait, what's line six? Um, line six and Ampeg are both owned by Yamaha Guitar Group, uh, Yamaha Corporation Japan. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But that exemplifies what we love about our job. We make equipment for musicians and our goal is to try to uncork uh, the creative process for artists uh, that inspires them to do new cooler things that maybe weren't previously possible that they didn't think was possible uh, and then they go and do something really great and they create something that never existed before and that inspires us to do something new and cool to keep trying to push that creativity forward uh, and that's why I showed that video, because I, I think it really exemplifies that. Um, so, who am I? Uh, I'm the manager of product design for Yamaha Guitar Group. A uh, little bit of my background, uh, right out of high school, I went in the Marine Corps for a little while, 
and then off to college, graduated with a BFA in industrial design from Southern Illinois University Carbondale. I did some contract work for Joss Design in Chicago at the time, a very big design firm in Chicago. Uh, and then I picked up a contract job with Beyond Design in Chicago, which was a very small shop back in the day. Uh, it's grown significantly since then. Mike Prince has really uh, been doing well. Uh, and then I moved to California with some friends from college. I worked at a small design firm uh, consultancy down in Irvine called Glow Design. It was founded by an uh, Art Center alum. But then in 2000, through a coworker at Glow Design, I heard that Line 6 was looking for an industrial designer. Uh, it's all the way up in Thousand Oaks. A bit of a trek when you're living in Newport Beach. But I got the job and I was excited to, to do something with the music industry. I grew up with guitar players. My, my dad played guitar and band for years. My grandpa played guitar for decades and decades and sang. So music's always been in my family. I was excited to get that opportunity. And I got the job in 2000, August. In fact, I just celebrated my 20th anniversary, August 1st. So it's been a while. Um, in eight years of designing amplifiers and effects and guitars and processors, uh, in 2008, we bought a little wireless company called X2 Digital Wireless. Uh, oh, Line 6, known at the time for the pod, which kind of revolutionized home recording for guitarists. Uh, it was the first digital modeling desktop unit you could just plug into a computer and use it as a DAW interface. And it sounded great. There was nothing like it at the time. And the kidney bean shape has become iconic with line six. Uh, and like I said, in uh, 2008, we bought the X2 Digital Wireless Company with these fantastic looking products like this. Um, they needed some help. But this was the original, this is the first digital wireless company uh, for musicians that existed. Uh, prior to that, all the wireless was analog with all the interference and channel selection nightmares and crosstalk that came with it. This revolutionized wireless systems for guitar. Today, everyone does digital wireless, but this was the first. And they joined Line 6 uh, and became part of our portfolio in 2008. Flash forward to 2014, Line 6 gets bought by Yamaha Corporation Japan. Uh, that was a big, a big deal for us because Line 6 had always been a very small company, privately held company, with a couple hundred employees. Shortly afterwards, Yamaha, having integrated Line 6 and our rapid process of product development, uh, gave us more control over the guitar aspect of their business and restructured corporate Yamaha, which had always been eight divisions or six divisions, I can't even remember anymore. But they restructured it to four divisions and made guitar its own division in Yamaha. All guitar products, including electric guitars, their amplifiers, had always been part of their band and orchestra division because uh, that's the way the company was structured and it's just where it landed. They started guitars for band and orchestra and everything that grew from that stayed there. So it was a big deal for Yamaha Corporation to restructure to four divisions. And then they branched off Line 6 and Yamaha Guitars into its own group, which they incorporated in 2018 and called Yamaha Guitar Group. And almost immediately afterwards, we purchased Ampeg, which invented amplification for bass products in the, I forget the year, 1950 something. Basses were upright basses back then and they weren't amplified. Guitars were just beginning to be amplified and the bass players were getting lost on stage, the big stand-up basses. So the founder of Ampeg, for those of you who are musicians, invented an amplified peg that replaced the peg in the bottom of your stand-up bass that would plug into a small amplifier, allowing them to be amplified. And everyone started buying. He was a jazz musician. He invented it for himself. Other musicians started wanting it, asked him for one. He decided to start his own company called the Amplified Peg Company. And his wife, who was clearly the marketer in the outfit, so that's a terrible name. We need to shorten it, call it Ampeg. And Ampeg was born. We bought Ampeg in 2018. And so now Yamaha Guitar Group is Yamaha Guitar Products, Line 6, and Ampeg. Uh, there's an old SVT Ampeg. We just released the 50th anniversary of that amp this year. Um, so ever heard of Yamaha? Small company out of Japan. 
give you a little quick history on Yamaha. Uh, this is Torakasu Yamaha. Uh, he was born in 1851. He was the son of a, uh, what would you call it, a uh, low-ranking samurai uh, of the Kishu clan. This was during the Meiji era in Japan, which is important because prior to the Meiji era, Japan had been a feudal state. There was a lot of competing clans and their samurai that defended them. Um, in this case, uh, uh, Torakasu Yamaha's father was an astronomer for the clan. He was a samurai, but he was also an astronomer. So he grew up with lots of books and scientific equipment and a fascination with technology and science, which his dad encouraged. Uh, and as I was saying, prior to this, to the Meiji era, it was feudal Japan. And this, the Meiji era brought Japan into the industrialized world. They started adopting Western technology uh, and it was really the beginning of the Industrial Revolution for Japan. So his background in science and technology played an important role uh, because he was fascinated with that sort of thing. And by the, his 30s, he was working as a repairman in around central Japan and specifically repairing medical devices. And it was at this time he was in Hamamatsu, Japan. A school asked him if, they could, if he could take a look at their reed organ, which is like a pipe organ, but instead of pipes with like whistles, it uses these brass reeds. It wasn't working, couldn't be repaired by anyone. Back then, Hamamatsu was a small village, really. So he said he would take a look at it, opened it up, and was instantly enamored with all the mechanical workings of this machine. So he was able to repair it, but he took copious notes while he was in there and decided he wanted to build his own reed organ. None of these things were made in Japan at the time. There were very few musical instruments made in Japan. Um, and so he did. He spent months building his own reed organ, carried it 150 kilometers on a pole over his back, over the mountains to Tokyo, and presented it to a music school in Tokyo. And they told him it was amazingly bad. So it wouldn't too. It was terribly out of tune. So he made a deal. He stayed in Tokyo rather than be discouraged. And he stayed by that school and studied the art of tuning for several months. And in doing so, he started his own company. He made his first reed organ and started his own company in 1887. And he developed this logo, which is a Japanese dragon holding a tuning fork because tuning to him was the key to everything. It was the science of the instrument. So that was the beginning of Yamaha as we know it today. 1887, he built his first organ, started his company, incorporated in 1897 as Nippon Gaki, which translates to Japanese musical instruments. And that's what Yamaha really was. It was Nippon Gaki. Um, he died suddenly in 1916, but it, his company was carried on by his successor, who was his vice president when he was running the company, but kept that ethos of technology and science leading to improvement. And in 1930, they built their first acoustic research lab, 1930. Up until that point, the Nippon Gaki products were known as acceptable copies of Western instruments. After they built the research lab and got into their own quality development, they became known as equal to or superior to their Western counterparts. Um, I forgot to mention this logo up here. This up on the left here you see is the current Yamaha Music Corporation logo, but the tuning forks always apart. And there have been many iterations of this over more than a century of development. Um, in 1940, Yamaha made their first guitar, a uh, classical guitar. And then after the Second World War, a lot of factories were uh, taken away from manufacturers in Japan. All the metalworking factories were taken away after the war to ensure they weren't being used to produce weapons of war. However, America provided a lot of financial assistance to Japanese companies to help restructure Japan. Yamaha took advantage of that and began making guitars in mass. And in 1955, they had their metal factory returned to them. And they decided to make motorcycles. This wasn't a shock to anyone. 
At the time, there were more than 200 companies in Japan that had turned to making motorcycles because trans cheap transportation was critical to Japan after the war. Uh, what they did though, is they copied this Japanese motor, uh, this German motorcycle, the DKW 125, uh, it was the most copied bike in the world. It was a very popular German motorcycle, but being Yamaha, they had to innovate. And so they made it a four speed transmission instead of a three. And they found a way to combine the Kickstarter with the gear shift axle inside the engine, which made it the first motorcycle that could be started in any gear as long as you disengaged the clutch. Uh, that revolutionized motorcycles forever. That's how they're built today. And this was in 1955. And Yamaha is still making motorcycles. This logo that you see right here is the Yamaha Motors logo. It looks the same, but it's not. The designers, and you'll all notice, the, the points of the pitchfork break through this outer barrier, and they don't on the music equipment. So if you ever see a Yamaha logo, with the tuning forks inside the circle, that's a Yamaha Music Corporation logo. If you see one like this where they break through, that is a Yamaha Motor Corporation. It's the same company, but it's not the same company. And I think on Facebook, they would call the relationship complicated. But this is how <laughs> Yamaha is structured. Um, and in 1987, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the founding of Nippon Gaki, they changed their name to Yamaha Corporation Japan. So that's our history lesson for Yamaha for today. Hope it's not too boring. Um, so what do I do? I'm the manager of the product design group at Yamaha Guitar Group. Uh, our roles and responsibilities uh, include industrial design, graphic design, and UI, UX design, and a lot of miscellaneous things. But I'll, I'll walk through the industrial design really quick. I regret I don't have a lot of slides on all of this. Most of my development work for older products is stuck on my work machine and I don't have access to it working from home. I only have current projects mostly, which is stuff I can't share. So I'm gonna talk through this really quick and I hope it inspires some questions or something you wanna know, I'm happy to answer those. So industrial design, the process, I'm just gonna go through our process really quickly. Um, we start with concept definition, which is a team effort between the, the, the product design group and our products group, which is product owners. These are the people that are the advocate for the customer and decide what products we should be making, what their feature sets should be. Uh, that's all part of the concept definition. When that product project gets approved for development, it enters the concept development stage and that's when I start. And the first part of my process for almost everything I do is to create what I call an envelope model. This is not probably how any consulting firm would do things, but this is how we work at Yamaha Guitar Group. So this is an example for me of an envelope model. This is for wireless product called the G70. Uh, and in this image here, you can see these, these green PCBAs here, 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 and here. I think you can see my mouse. These are the antennas. They have specific keep away areas. They can't be near metal, 20 millimeters on axis in any direction, but you can see these all face different directions. Wireless is complicated. <laughs> but I'll start with an envelope model before I do anything. And then I'll use just this as an underlay. And that's when I actually go into my sketch development. I'll generate hundreds of concepts over the top of this. That way, any, I know anything I'm working on is rooted in reality. It's grounded in what can be done. And the first step of this envelope model is generally to condense everything as small as physically possible because in the world of guitar playing, pedal board space is premium. Nobody wants anything bigger than it has to be as a general rule. So I work in reality. Everything is based on real parts that are gonna be in the actual product. Uh, sketch refinement, we narrow it down th through sketches. We have lots of design reviews. Uh, pick directions. And then once we have a few directions that we really like settled down, I'll go back into 3D and begin making uh, more advanced models. Uh, again, I don't have <laughs> images to show for all this, um, but we'll go through some stuff later. Uh, we have candid ID over the envelope. At that point, I'll start with cost estimation by collaborating with our mechanical engineering team to make sure that what I'm designing is likely to hit the cost targets. Uh, you know, cast 
aluminum parts have gotten a lot more expensive. Bent sheet metal has gotten a lot more expensive in the last six, seven years. Uh, all these things are factors in what we can do in the day to day. And then sometimes we have to sacrifice and we have to go with plastic just because the material cost is so much cheaper, even if we don't want to, or find ways to do hybrid products that are partially plastic and part metal to save cost and weight where needed. But it's all part of that process. And then we'll take that through to a refined couple of concepts and narrow it down to one, which will become the final ID model. At that point, I start taking into consideration uh, things like draft and part breakup, CMT, color material texture. Um, it's easy to design stuff without draft because right angles and perpendicular faces always look great. Uh, but to say you want some kind of a texture on something, well, then you have to reference your uh, mold tech, which is a US company, or Yik Sang, which is the most popular texture vendor in the Asian market for factories there. Uh, and the books will tell you, they'll show you the texture and they'll tell you for this texture, you need a three degree draft. So I try to design my final ID handoff models with the appropriate draft for the texture that I'm going to call out in my handoff documentation. Um, I'll also try to put placeholder silk art on my models. Uh, I'll propose part breakup. I try to pre-engineer is what I call it as much as possible so that our mechanical engineering team doesn't have to start from scratch and try to figure these things out. Because what invariably happens if you do that, they won't be able to make it the way you think they'll be able to make it. And then the whole ID has to change to accommodate manufacturing. So in a corporate design setting, it's better to design with manufacturing or DFM upfront and give it your best swag there so you don't have to make these changes because it doesn't only sacrifice the design intent, but it can have significant impacts on your time to market. And in a fast paced market like music, where the technology changes literally every year, missing a month or two, it can kill a project. Uh, and that's just wasted development time. So once we've got these things, part breakup, CMT, uh, tooling considerations, part costs estimated, uh, which all can depend on what vendors you're able to use. I'll generate handoff documentation that includes rendered images, which are for presentations for outward facing customer validation. I'll provide a visual walkthrough of any complicated features in the design, CMT callouts, and then I'll hand off the 3D model to our mechanical engineering team uh, and they'll begin their work on it. But we still collaborate and we still get prototype parts made either 3D printed in-house or prototypes made from our China office, which is very cost effective. We get them in usually a four day turnaround. And we have to review those parts. Then we have off tool parts that have to be reviewed and checked and make sure design, you have to always make sure design intent is maintained throughout and that nothing's slipping through the cracks, which is really easy when you have six, seven, eight products going at once. Um, and then we move into the graphic design part of our group, of the part design group, which is silk cart on the products. Uh, our graphic design guys help me with the placeholder art and final art. Anything that's on product or in the box, like uh, amp toppers, cheat sheets, uh, grill stickers, quick start guides, anything that goes in the box with our product is generated by my group. Um, the UI UX design is a huge part because most of our products have a software component. If not an on screen, like the Helix, this is a limited edition blue one that we did, but this has a rather large screen and a very complex UI, but it's very easy to use. This is all done by our UI UX team. They will build all of this using assets generated in Adobe Illustrator. They lay out the UI in Keynote, which allows you to step through the UI, use buttons to change states. And you can really prototype a elaborate, very complex UI really quickly and test it with people to see if it makes sense and see if there's ways to come up with easier, less button push ways to get around a UI. Something as complicated as Helix here has more features than I will ever use, but it's simple to use. You don't need a manual to use this product. And that's just a testament to how good our UI UX team is. Um, so there's the mock-ups and prototypes for GUI and physical prototypes. Um, all the asset generation for our software team, all the stuff that gets used in Keynote from Illustrator gets exported out as assets for our software teams to actually build into the software. So there's no double work, there's no wasted effort there. Um, another big thing that our graphic and UI UX team does is they help maintain 
uh, our branding. Uh, and that's a team effort with our marketing and marketing communications team. Um, and they maintain the style guides for Line 6 and Ampeg. Yamaha style guides and Yamaha design is generally done by Yamaha Japan and Design Lab, which is their own industrial design company that's part of Yamaha. Uh, an exception to that would be the THR. The THR is a desktop amplifier that Yamaha made, a uh, hugely successful product for them. And after a few years, they wanted to update it. This was my first chance to do industrial design directly for a Yamaha product. I was teamed up with uh, a great industrial designer named Ryan Seguya, who prior to Yamaha was an automotive designer at Nissan. Uh, and we were tasked to come up with the next version of the THR amplifier. This is the THR amplifier as it was for seven years or so. Again, a very popular product. Um, this was my proposal. Uh, Ryan submitted some proposals. They did a lot of market testing here in the United States, in Japan, in Europe. Uh, and this is what they ended up shipping as a final product. So I was, I was pretty happy to be able to finally work with another designer and, uh, and get a, a Yamaha branded product out into the market. And that's kind of that section. Let's see, are there, is the slides not changing? Well, I'm looking at the comments really quick. Okay. Who do you interact with for pricing? Um, for pricing, we've done enough of enough products that we have a good idea of what things cost. We have a lot of comparable products that we've made generally recently in the last couple of years. So something like a cast aluminum housing, depending on its size, we'll usually have something in our existing library. We can say, oh, that was like a four and a half dollar part. And this is about the same size. So we, we think it'll be about a four and a half dollar part. And we cost estimate that way. Obviously, until you really meet with a, a CM, which I'll get into in a minute, uh, you don't know the exact pricing, but we're, we're generally pretty close. We're usually within a dollar or so on a bomb that might be $125, $150. We can usually land within a dollar on our estimates because we're getting pretty good at it. Uh, all right, so let's see. Next, what is corporate design? It's kind of what I went through. Um, here we have a couple products. You can see this is the uh, HX effects, which is a multi effects unit. This is the THR2. Over here we have the Helix in its native black anodized. Ah, so I'm gonna run through really quickly how we kind of manage corporate design. Uh, there's three real approaches to working on, on products for manufacture. There's OEM, Original Equipment Manufacturing. I'm sure most of you have heard that. Um, that's what we almost exclusively do. And OEM is where you're doing all the design, you're doing all the engineering, software, everything, but you're using a contract manufacturer to actually produce the product. They, they have the tooling, they have the injection molding machines, they have over molding machine, you know, all, all of this stuff is their capabilities. Um, usually it's multiple factories. You'll have one factory make your PCBAs and test them and then they'll be delivered to the company that's going to do the actual manufacturing where they do the injection molded or bent sheet metal or casting or whatever the housing is going to be. And they do the final assembly and final test there. Uh, that's the most common thing. The next down the ladder would be JDM, which is joint design manufacturing. We've done this a little bit. Occasionally we're trying to do more of it because the benefit with joint design manufacturing is that it's a benefit to both companies when you can pull it off. Uh, it's a collaborative effort where you'll do, we'll do all the design. Uh, but we'll contract it with a factory that has their own engineering resources and their own production facility. So we'll do the design from industrial design standpoint. They may do some of the electrical design and they may do the bulk of the mechanical engineering and then actually manufacture the product. Excuse me. Um, it can be tricky. It can be more work than you'd think it would <laughs> because there's because of all that collaboration and the time differences and language differences sometimes, but it can be rewarding for both people. And the, the big benefit is it offloads what's dependent on your group. Um, I didn't mean to take that slide away. It, it offloads the load on your resources and allows you to work on other products at the same time um, because you're using their engineering resources. Uh, the third 
is ODM, which is original design manufacturing, also sometimes called white boxing. This is something we never do, and I hope we never do it. Um, ODM is when you're taking something that a, a factory has designed and developed themselves, and then they offer it to sale for licensing to whoever wants it. Um, a good example I'll give you this is if, if you've ever gone on Amazon and you've looked up a product, you needed something, and suddenly you see five of them and they all look pretty much the same, that's ODM. They're probably, here's a good example. So go on Amazon and look up a, a, a rivet nut insert tool, right? I just bought one of these this is why I know this. This is a great tool. I bought one. It works wonderfully. Hey, look at that. It's pretty much the exact same tool. This is ODM. This is, this company makes this tool and someone who wanted to enter the market, the tool market maybe, and it's usually what it is, it's trying to break into the market. They'll say, can we get that? But can we get it with red and black handles with our logo on it? And they say, sure, it'll cost you this much. And then they buy them in bulk and they sell them on Amazon or through their store or wherever. And another company says, hey, we'd like a tool like that. Can we change it to orange and black and put our logo on it? Sure you can, here you go. That's ODM in a nutshell. Um, like I said, it's not something we're really into doing. But it does have benefits. If, if you're, in the, you're in that market, you're trying to break into and get market share and get your name out there, it's not a bad way to go. We don't have that problem with Yamaha, Line 6, or Ampeg, so it's not something we pursue. Um, what else do I have here to talk about? Um, actually, where am I at? Okay, sorry, I lost my notes here for a minute. So going from ODM, uh, I get asked a lot if we work with design firms on our stuff. Uh, we have done some design work with firms in the past when we've been really overloaded. There's pros and cons with that. Um, the pro of doing stuff fully in-house is that you get full ownership from start to finish of a product, from, from napkin sketch to finished product out in the market, interacting with musicians who are playing your gear on stage and rave about it. That feels great. Um, the con of working in a corporate environment is that you're kind of limited the scope and the products that you're going to work on depending on what your company makes and what your uh, your portfolio consists of. Um, so that's one of the things that was really nice when I worked in consulting was one day I'd be working for Chicago Cutlery, the next day for Contico Toolboxes, you know, maybe next week I was working for Baxter Medical doing some medical devices. It's a very different. Has Yamaha licensed any back as ODM? No, as far as I know, Yamaha has never uh, licensed out any of their equipment. Um, that's a good question, though. Uh, they do a lot of licensing, and I, I can get into this uh, later if you want. Yamaha is such a huge company. It's like a $4.5 billion a year company. Um, everyone knows about the watercraft and the motorcycles and the guitars and the pianos uh, and the drums, probably. Um, what they might not know is the golf clubs. Uh, the engines that they've made for Nissan, uh, their semiconductor business. Uh, Yamaha is huge. They have a huge portfolio and they do a lot of licensing of technology. I don't think they actually license any projects. Um, hey, Max, I have to grab something really quick. Can I take a two second break? Sure thing. All right. Sorry about that. Let me see if I can pause my microphone here for a second. I'm so sorry about that. I'm back. Um, is this coming through okay again? Yes. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, that's a good question about the licensing and the ODM. They license a lot of technology, but as far as I know, they don't do any ODM work for other people. <sighs> other things, let's see, other things I miss about or want to mention about like consulting versus corporate design is consulting when I was doing, I mean, it's 20 years ago that I was doing consulting, but it tended to work at a, a faster pace as far as going project to project, less concerned overall with the landed cost of your finished product. You know, it was more about getting the design right and less about delivering uh, a finished product. That's changed, of course, uh, design firms have had to expand their, their functionality, you know, what they've, they've offered. And you see a lot more turnkey design even from design firms, which I think is great. Um, the, other, the benefit there, I'll say, it's the best way to put this. One of the things that like when I've worked with design firms on behalf of Line 6 is they have less domain knowledge of, of the products that you're working on. Uh, just because you live in that world and they don't. And we had, we had a company do a project for us and they spent 20 minutes of their pitch was, hey, have you guys heard about this company Guitar Center? You should really look into them, which obviously is like the biggest distributor of music products. So we know this. Um, the benefit though, in working with a design firm is that often when you have a, a, a when you hire a firm to do stuff, People are a lot more, people, I'll say at like the, the executive level, are a lot more open to new ideas, to blue sky concepts, um, than if someone in-house comes up with a crazy idea, they'll say, that's a crazy idea. If a design firm says, that's, here's this really cool thing, they'll say, hey, that's great, can we do it? You know, um, so there's, there's a trade-off there. Um, so they, they tend to meet less resistance from people who would not let you try something. Um, the domain experience is a big deal, but it's, you know, any good designer is going to do his research and he's going to nail the market. Um, consulting designers tend to be more in tune with current, you know, quote unquote trends, what's fashionable. Um, that was one of my concerns working on the THR product is I've worked as the sole industrial designer at Line 6 for 17 years at the time the only industrial designer. Now that's, you can't get more bubble than that. So I was working in a bubble. So working with Ryan at, at uh, Design Lab was like the first chance to really work with a, a high level designer in a kind of competitive way and see if, you know, if I can match up. And so that was, that's why that was such an exciting project for me to work on. Um, Cause you do kind of get that bubble mentality when you're working on the same thing by yourself day in and day out. That's a, a, another thing that's fun. That's one I've enjoyed working with firms like RKS um, is they get to go in their office and sit with a bunch of designers for a, you know, a few hours a day and, and come up with ideas. So it's just something to keep in mind as you guys go out and look for jobs if you're considering a corporate job or a consulting job. Uh, you know, how big is their design team? You know, are you gonna be in a bubble? Will you have support? Will you have people to help you know, learn on the job, people you can mentor from? that sort of thing. Um, so here I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit of like the G70, uh, G75 wireless. This is a family of wireless projects. Um, and I, ho I hope you find this in informative or something. Um, wireless is challenging. I showed you that envelope model earlier with the antennas all aiming in different directions. Um, but this was a project I was given. It was the new wireless force a few years back. Uh, this is my process. Uh, this is the, the transmitter, the belt pack. And these are just really quick, just thumbnails, thinking of ideas, how I want to break things apart. This isn't even remotely all of them. Um, but this is just some stuff I threw together. This is the process for me. You know, I, I, this, I already had done the envelope model. I knew kind of what was inside. Um, we're going to pretend this sketch doesn't exist. Everyone just don't look at this one. This one's really bad. Okay. Just ignore that one. Um, but you can see the process here going through ideas. This one here ends up being pretty close to what we landed on, but different. One of the concerns with the wireless belt packs, the transmitters, uh, was previous ones and competitor ones. If you, they get dropped, they tend to pop open. The batteries spill out or they break. So we wanted something where that wouldn't happen. So I was trying to come up with ideas where the batteries would always be secure. The thing wouldn't break. Um, you know, there's ways here, 
hinged at one side, less likely to break, but you know, it's still relying on this hinge holding and not coming apart. Um, down here, as you can see, we're kind of getting towards a real direction down here. Uh, the next slide, this is kind of where I was landing, what I wanted to make. Um, and then this is me figuring out how I'm gonna put that thing together. There's this metal rail, which at the time had a lanyard hoop in the corner. Uh, the spec was to have a display and a couple buttons that were hidden by the battery door. So that's what's going on here. Um, and then this is me thinking out with my mechanical engineers in mind, how are we gonna break this thing apart? How many parts is it? Um, how is it gonna be held together? And then to the right, you see what ended up being the finished product. Uh, in the end, to make it smaller and more usable, they decided they actually wanted the, dis the numeric display outside where it's visible. Um, so we had to make some changes, but this is the finished line of products. Uh, and if you remember this envelope model here, uh, that became this 3D model in SolidWorks. Um, at this point in the development process, it still didn't have buttons on it. Those were added during the process. They said, you know, we think we need a mute button and a channel button. Um, and that led to this model, which as you can see is, you know, that's the finished product there. Uh, this represents probably six weeks worth of work, this whole family. Um, and that's the whole presentation of that. Uh, but I do have, let me do a new share and show you this screen. This screen. All right. Is everyone seeing my SolidWorks model here? I think so. Yep. All right. So yes, sir. this is an example of my design model. This is what I handed off to our mechanical engineering team. Um, you can see I've, I've got all kinds of screws in here. I've got our jack, a colored nut. These are the clasps. This door operates on a rail. This metal frame is actually a rail that rides in a channel and goes, slides open. So if you drop this, it cannot open. You can throw it at a wall, it won't open. You can drive over with your car and it won't break and it won't open. Yes, I tested this. Um, and if I, if, you know, if I hide this, you can see, you know, this is back when they had the display inside with the buttons and a locking button. A switch in here so it couldn't be accidentally have the channel changed on it. Um, but this is an ID model. This is not a mechanical engineering model. If I, uh, if I hide these things, make them transparent, you can see there's no PCBA in here. Um, there's no mechanical, not many mechanical feature. I think, you know, I had these couple screw bosses, but I didn't go crazy. Um, this was an ID model. And then I've imported into the same thing. This is the actual finished product model. This is an engineering model. Uh, if I go in here and I hide this, you know, you can see this is the real deal. And there was a lot of back and forth with our engineering team as we develop the, the project. Uh, the design intent kind of stayed the same, but then moving this display outside of the battery door area uh, made this feature, which I really liked it, you know, mimicked the, the angle of the antenna uh, and it kind of kept the whole thing uh, together, but it didn't make sense anymore because there wasn't room. It allowed us to shrink this whole thing. And, and in the end, a belt pack for a wireless transmitter for a musician, size is king. Uh, so we did everything we could to make it small. I had to lose the little lanyard corner because there just wasn't room for it. Um, but that's also part of working in a corporate environment where you're seeing a product through to the, to the very end is you have to make compromises here and there and you do the best you can to keep your design intent intact. Some things worked out well. The spec I've been given for antennas meant that this was as big as, this is the size this antenna area had to be, which was bulky and I didn't like it. And in the end, working with our, our, wireless engineer, we were able to get that size down, something smaller, less obtrusive. Um, but you can see how well design intent was maintained throughout. Um, not exactly what I handed off, but you know, not bad, not bad. Uh, and that's kind of my whole presentation.